Season three of The Fairer Sense is sponsored by FreshBooks, the cloud accounting software for freelancers. That's the easiest possible way to send invoices and stay on top of your accounting. Stay tuned for info on how you can get a free 30-day trial while supporting the podcast. Welcome to The Fairer Sense. With me, Tanya. And me, Kara. Women, money, and the fight to break even. Because we give a shit. And you should too. Invisible labor, microaggressions, and women's anger. Hey, Kara. Hey, Tanya. It's so nice to be talking to you, even though we're going to probably express some rage today. (laughs) It's the calm before the storm. (laughs) Really? We're talking about some stuff that I think you and I in kind of planning this episode out have have almost struggled to define it or to talk about how to frame all of this. But really what we're talking about today is the cultural moment that we find ourselves in. I think perhaps even more than any of our other shows, this is really just so, so timely of here we are, 2019, X, Y, and Z things are happening. And frankly, women are kind of angry about it. I mean, personally, I've been angry since birth. I think, <laughs> I think I came out angry at many, many things and have maintained that anger uh, for my whole 30 years of life. But yes, culturally, we're at a place where more and more women are publicly saying, I'm angry, I'm furious, I'm mad, I'm fed up. And specifically calling out actions and systems that have made them angry And also the consistent and constant work that makes them angry. Yeah, the undercurrent of all of what we're talking about today is, of course, the invisible labor that women are expected to do in our society. And I think the invisibility piece to me is so evident right now, like with the Me Too movement happening, and I think a lot of men you know, I sort of like I empathize for them and them saying like, wait a minute, but why have we never been hearing about this before? Why all of a sudden is all of this anger coming from? It reminds me of like being in a bad relationship with a kind of clueless boyfriend when you go and you're like, okay, I'm ready to break up. And he's like, "Uh, wait, what? Where's this even coming from? And it's like, just because you haven't heard me and all the things I've said doesn't mean that I haven't been dissatisfied and angry this whole time. We're sort of like having that conversation on a large societal scale right now. Oh my gosh. Complete agreement. I think about all of the women who have come before us our mothers, our grandmothers, our great grandmothers, and frankly, all the shit that they put up with. It's all of these things have been happening forever. It's just only now women have come just far enough that some of us have our own platforms and some of us are taken seriously. And thank God, a lot of the women who have these platforms and are taken seriously are using their microphones to advocate for some of these things. But none of this is new. (laughs) Like absolutely none of this is new. If you thought it was new, catch up, read a book. <laughs> oh gosh, yes. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I've heard some people recently talking about Me Too and sort of how like women are always dragging social issues into conversations. This was, you may not be surprised to hear, this was on personal finance Twitter. And I just, I was thinking like all of the Me Too stuff we're talking about are women in a workplace or women attempting to get a job, you know, sort of something bad happening in the course of attempting to advance her career. But somehow because it's women, it doesn't count as career or economic or money related. It's a social issue. I'm putting in sarcastic air quotes. It's like, it's yet another instance of just women not being taken as seriously and why we're in the situation to begin with, why women are so fed up and angry because 
such proof right now of just how not seriously we've been taken for so long that so many of the things that are coming out now are greeted with such shock. Yeah. So I want to take a second before we get too far into this and just define what we kind of mean by some of this invisible labor and constant crap (laughs) that women have been putting up with. You don't think constant crap is specific enough? (laughs) I I didn't want to swear again. So I was like, "Hmm, I'll do something a little more PC. (laughs) Oh my goodness. But some of you are probably familiar with the term microaggression, but I'm going to define it. It was defined by Columbia professor Daryl Sue as brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional intentional that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative slights and insults towards people of color. So now this obviously comes with a a racial tone, but it also shows up in gender roles. In class roles, microaggressions show up all over the place. I think this is a little bit of a new vernacular for many people, especially older people. And I think it's so important that this has a name because this happens constantly. So I don't actually watch the show, But I saw this gift set of Brooklyn Nine-Nine where Jake Peralta and Amy Santiago, who are married on the show, are going through their day and they're doing the exact same activity and they're getting two very different responses. So like they go get a cup of coffee and they buy it from this white guy who's the coffee vendor. And he just says to Jake, like, have a great day. And to Amy, he says, you have a pretty mouth. Have a great day. And then, you know, they're both police officers and Amy's in like her full police garb, like hat, badge, everything is out, police officer. And this man comes running up and is like, excuse me, do you know where I could find a police officer? And then Jake strolls in, in like chinos and a plaid button down. And the guy's like, oh, you're obviously a police officer. And Amy's like, I'm in my uniform. Those are excellent examples of microaggressions. (laughs) Those are perfect examples, and um, you definitely need to watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine one way or another. Like, borrow a password. I'll lend you mine because it's such a good show. It's that. It's all of the different microaggressions. It's also the different invisible labor that we all do. And I think, you know, the idea of women's anger feels so timely right now. We're at this moment where there have just been a ton of books that have come out. Rebecca Traister has a book out. Soraya Chamali has a book out. Gemma Hartley has a book out. We're going to talk to Gemma later in the show. There are a bunch of books kind of now all bubbling up at this moment to say, hey, like, Just because you haven't noticed the stuff we've been putting up with doesn't mean it hasn't been happening. And frankly, we're pissed about it. We're pissed it took so long for people to have microaggressions in their vocabulary. We're pissed that people don't see all of the invisible labor that we're doing all the time. And it's sort of like to use the bad boyfriend analogy again, like just because we haven't said it all to you doesn't mean we haven't been feeling it. It just means we knew how you'd react. You, we knew you wouldn't care. We knew you wouldn't think it was a big deal. You might say like, oh, they're there. Uh, yes. It's like all of those those small things like, oh, you're so cute when you're mad, right? Or the, just like the brushing aside of concerns and experiences is what really, really pisses me off, frankly. And of course, this as in all things, microaggressions are intersectional because if you are a woman of color, you're going to have to put up with racial microaggressions as well as gendered microaggressions. And something that I know people of color get all the time is like, well, where are you really from? And it's like Ugh. South Carolina, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> or like Austin or Tahoe, right? Whatever. It's like, I'm from here, but you're othering me. And that's not okay. And I'm just like trying to get a cup of coffee or what have you. And you're all, hmm, justify your existence in America to me real quick. <sighs> yeah. Or like there was recently Stephen King who is married to a wonderful novelist named Tabitha King. Together they made a big donation to, I think, the New England Historical Society, something like that. But the news stories that came out about it said Stephen King and his wife made donation to said organization. And her set of tweets about it were pretty amazing. Of course, he had to amplify them, but I appreciated that he put his endorsement on it where she's like, how about Tabitha King and her husband do this thing? Which I will just say one tiny personal note. I was recently on CNBC talking about my book and the story that they then ran from it on the website because they had to do a print version referred to Tanya Hester and her husband and his name never appears in it. I think it says Mark in one place, but like there's even a photo and it's Tanya Hester and her husband. (laughs) 
I love that so much. I love that. So much. I know. I'm like, on one hand, like, that's not really the end state we're going for here. We're going for gender equality, but it's still like in a world where so many women have been described as and his wife or and his partner or whatever it might be. I was like, there's something satisfying about that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes, totally. It is satisfying. It is not the end goal, like you say, but it is satisfying. And yes, I think this is a really pertinent example because women have for millennia literally lost their names in our society, right? We have our father's name from birth and then most women or throughout history, women have taken their husband's names. And your identity, the person that you grew up as gets erased. Or my favorite is, and my favorite, I obviously mean my least favorite, <laughs> is when <laughs> I'm getting all these wedding invites now because like all my friends are getting married and that's very exciting. But it'll be like, Dr. and Mrs. Smith invite you to like the celebration of their son, James. I don't know if a James Smith. <laughs> I'm not actually like mocking a friend of mine. But, you know, the possessive is the doctor and his wife, you know, like he owns her. And mm -hmm. I, that infuriates me. And it's one of the reasons I will never change my name. And I can go from zero to 60 on that so fast. I mean, like really, I can just be chilling, drinking my chamomile tea and someone will be like, should women take their husband's names? And I'm like, I'm furious. <laughs> Uh, but it's just one of the many, I mean, and also too, just on the name thing, it's something like 70% of Americans think it should be illegal for a woman to keep her name after marrying a man, which is doubling down on this microaggression. It's saying like, I don't fundamentally think that you have the right to exist outside of your husband, which is so offensive and so hurtful and frankly feels like very overwhelming when you think about how we are trying to change society. I know some very badass feminist women who have opted to change their names and I think that's a deeply personal choice. And so you do you. Like whatever feels like the right choice with your name, that's your call. But I do think that those of us who don't, I didn't change my name, are expected to answer for it at a different level, even with progressive thinking people. You know, I have been fortunate that not a lot of people have said like, oh, explain yourself. But I know that that's in part because of who I surround myself with. And like you said, there are plenty of people who think I should have had to change my name and shouldn't be able to exist as my own person. And I'm sorry, but like CNBC wrote about Tanya Hester and her husband. So screw you. <laughs> <laughs> screw you. Uh, so... Obviously, we have a lot of feelings around this. <laughs> and there's a lot some, to some rage, you might even say. Some rage. <laughs> and it, tr I mean, these microaggressions happen in so many ways. And please do write to us and tell us about your microaggressions so that I can get furious all over again. <laughs> um, there's really a lot to it because it's so hard. I think of microaggressions as like I'm walking forward, I'm walking down the street, and someone is throwing little plastic balls at me. You know, they don't hurt. They're not going to damage me, but it's constant. And by the time I get to the end of the street, I've had 15 plastic balls thrown at me and I still have to take a right and go down four more streets, you know, versus a man is walking down the street and he has zero plastic balls thrown at him. And so just the effort required to exist sometimes in a marginalized body, whether that is a body of color or that is a gendered body or that is a non-binary body, it is very, very exhausting. I think rage comes first. Like when you have the energy to be angry about things, you are angry about it. But then sometimes you get to the end of your, of your walk and you're like, I am exhausted from just surviving the onslaught. And I don't have the energy to be angry, which is another show really that we could <laughs> dig into. But this exhaustion from the rage and from the onslaught is very real. It is real. Although I have a different take. I actually think that we are socialized so aggressively as women and girls and people of color to be the ones who make all the concessions and the ones who compromise and the ones who put on the brave face that I think the anger comes from the exhaustion. What do you say we jump into the interviews? Yes, let's do it. talked to 
Gemma Hartley, who is the author of the book Fed Up, Emotional Labor, Women, and the Way Forward. And longtime Verisense listeners may remember her from season one, episode four on emotional labor. She is someone who really helped bring the term emotional labor into the vocabulary of a lot more people with a viral piece she wrote for Harper's Bazaar about a year and a half ago. And last fall, she came out with the book that's much more of an expansion about that. If you're not familiar with emotional labor, I definitely suggest going back and listening to episode four first because we kind of move on from that discussion into sort of the bigger picture of all of this, all of the invisible labor that women are doing, how we feel about it, and really what we can do about it. I wanted to look more at the cultural reasons why emotional labor is imbalanced in this way. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is looking at our historical views on emotional labor, Mm -hmm. how this got to be women's work and only women's work, and why it's so hard to change that. And a big part of that is because this work is really invisible. It's not the physical tasks that you're doing around the house. It's not the actual doing of the to-do list. It's making the to-do list. It's dealing with the emotions of those around you. And that's really hard for people to see if you aren't the one doing it. So men have trouble seeing this because they aren't the ones doing it. In looking back at the history and the origins of some of this stuff, I mean, has there ever been a time in recorded history when women weren't doing emotional labor? Not here. (laughs) But some of the really interesting stuff that came up in researching this book was that there are other cultures where men are balancing emotional labor with women. Tribes outside of Western socialization are doing this work very equally. So it's not something that is hardwired into our nature that women are the ones that should be doing emotional labor. We've been socialized this way. And I think that's really great to hear because that means we can undo it and we can find better balance. It's not something that we're fighting nature against. It's something that we just have to readjust our culture and our expectations. There are a couple different levels on which you could think about addressing it for, you know, just like our, our average listener. So you've got, how do you raise children who are not socialized the same way? You've got, how do you address this in your romantic partnership? And then you've probably got also some dynamics at work or in your other volunteer life. I mean, starting with kids, what do you recommend for raising little boys? And I imagine there's also something you want to do with raising little girls so that they don't fall into the old patterns of carrying all that weight. I think the most important thing is women are the ones that need to change their behavior first. And I think that is because we need to know that we can't change other people (laughs) necessarily. Now, I think we should all be in equal partnerships. But if you're starting out on this long journey towards balancing out emotional labor with your partner, you need to change some things first so that your children will see that this is how it needs to be. Mm -hmm. So... I think the most important thing first is setting boundaries on the emotional labor you are doing. Don't do it for other people. Don't do it for your partner. And that can sound a little bit harsh, but if you want your children to know that you don't, you know, your daughters to know you don't have to do everything, you want your sons to know like, hey, you need to do stuff too, you need to set really clear boundaries and not feel like it is your job to keep everyone comfortable, everyone happy all of the time. Another huge part of it is you do need to have a partner who is doing their fair share of work, who is noticing what needs to be done, not waiting to be asked to do something and to really be an active participant in your shared life. One of the things that I've thought a lot about since our last conversation is the idea of, you know, your article started with the anecdote of the boxes in the middle of the closet. There's sort of the chores side of it. And then there's also the stuff that doesn't go with a physical task that's really just purely emotional, doing the management of people's emotions and and taking responsibility for that. I'm curious, like in looking deeper at this, if you have sort of any recommendations for folks who have maybe that mix where it's like the chore mix is fairly equal, but there's still the, the emotional side of it and kind of the managing feelings and being the one to kind of keep the mental lists. Talking about 
like the split of chores, like if you have it really equal and you don't need to talk about it and you don't need to remind them, there is still other stuff that needs to be done. There is planning that needs to be done. And I think a lot of it is we just need to talk about it and really be open about what our experience is. Because my husband really didn't understand everything that was going into our life mm -hmm. until I sort of started writing this book and opened it up to him and was like, look, look at everything that is going on in our lives and how much of that involves mental work. And that takes up a lot of space and time, and it really can hamper your other work if you are constantly the list keeper and the emotion manager, and you're worrying about all of these little details. Mm -hmm. It really, it really does put a burden on one person if that's not shared equally. I think a lot of the time we think like, oh, well, men could never do what we do, and that's just not true. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times we're not giving them that space or if a small mistake is made, we'll swoop back in. And you really need to trust that there's a learning process to be had there mm -hmm. and that they're fully capable. It's really infantilizing when we're like, oh, men couldn't do this. Mm -hmm. They can, they're grown adults. And if you pick someone as a partner that you view as another one of your children, you're probably not in a great partnership there. One of the things that I recently thought about is I was visiting some relatives there in their 60s and definitely have that kind of old school dynamic of the husband, you know, is like, oh, well, this is your domain. This is your house. And you can see like the wife doing tons of emotional labor, but also getting some sense of satisfaction from that. Like, this is my domain and I have control over this. And I've wondered about that. Like, is there a trade-off of if you try to share some of that emotional labor, losing that sense of like, this is the part of the world that I have control over? Yes, this is something that I think is really interesting. And this is what makes changing so hard for both men and women. Mm -hmm. Women are giving something up when they give up all of the control of emotional labor. Mm -hmm. Because there is a certain sense of pride that goes along with being the one who has it all together, who is doing everything. And there's this very strong urge to be a perfectionist or to do it all, have it all. And women are really rising to the occasion, but it's also exhausting us and killing us. And we need to just give it up a little bit. And it is going to mean that we're giving up some of that control. We are going to have to figure out what we want with that time and with that mental space. And that can be scary. Change is scary and everyone resists it, even if it's for the better. And so it does take work on both parties' part. One of the things that I know isn't a focus of the book but is something that we all are, are dealing with is thinking about emotional labor in the workplace. And particularly, you know, it's pretty well documented that if you have a, a meeting, it's always going to be, or it's going to tend to be a woman who gets asked to take the notes or to bring the coffee, sometimes even very senior women. Addressing something in your personal life is one thing. You've got a partner, hopefully you can be honest with them. But I'm curious if you have thoughts on if a woman feels like, okay, at work, I keep getting asked to get the coffee or I keep getting asked to be the one who takes the notes, like how would you suggest she try to address that? So I think the best thing is to bring it up in sort of a non-confrontational way, which sucks because men can be direct, but we aren't at that point in our culture where mm -hmm. women can speak freely without consequence which is part of why I'm so big on changing emotional labor from our, you know, from the ground up, from our kids, from our partnerships. And eventually I think that spills into the workplace. Mm -hmm. But it's true. Women are the ones that are asked to do these tasks to make everything a little bit more pleasant and more comfortable. We're the ones that are going to be asked to like, you know, let me bounce some ideas off of you, but then I'm not going to do the same for you. It's sort of giving and giving and giving. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, it's setting boundaries. You have to set your own boundaries before anything can change. And unfortunately, that might mean it goes on to the next woman who also has to set boundaries. And eventually everyone needs to come into a place of equality in the workplace but it's hard to do right now because our culture is not quite there. 
you know, Rebecca Traster's new book and Soraya Chamali's book, like the, the anger books. Why now, essentially? Like, is this a time, a moment in history when we're feeling especially angry and fed up? I recently did a roundtable on women's anger and the publishing experience at this moment. And I said that when I set out to write this book, I didn't set out to write an angry book. And yet, there is a lot of anger in this book. There is a lot of frustration in this book. Throughout the book, we'll use a lot of different words. I'm angry about this. I'm disappointed about this. I'm frustrated about this. And I'm never fully going into that place of rage or really outright anger because you're not allowed to, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And I think that right now publishing this book alongside these other books about women's anger shows that we're at a point of change because this is not terribly new. There was a lot of anger in the women's movement before. And with, with first wave, with second wave, with what we have now, which is, you know, a lot of little waves. I think that right now women's anger is coming up because anger is what drives change. And so there is anger in this book. And that's not to say there's hate in this book mm -hmm. or that there is anger towards men, but there is an anger towards the system that is keeping us stuck in this place, mm -hmm. which isn't good for men and isn't good for women. And we're ready to see that, get mad about it and change it. Running a business of one means you wear many hats, marketer, content creator, CEO, office custodian. There are many things that demand your attention and you need all the assistance you can get. That's why cloud accounting software FreshBooks is so cool. They take the work out of getting paid so you can focus on doing the work you need to keep your business running. With FreshBooks, you can create a customized invoice, track all your income, and link a business credit card to automatically track business spending. FreshBooks makes it super simple to do your accounting. The website is clean and easy to understand, and it makes accounting one less thing that you need to worry about as a business owner. Most accounting services come with lots of bells and whistles that you don't need as a freelancer, and FreshBooks cuts all of that out to make it as easy to use as possible. We've both used it and can attest to it being the easiest possible way to do your accounting, and maybe the prettiest. Plus, FreshBooks has recently gotten into the events game, which you know I love, with their hashtag I make a living events around the US. They talk to freelancers and small business owners about how they make a living, which is something that we both think is pretty cool. Head to freshbooks.com slash TFC to claim your 30-day free trial and enter the Fairer Sense in the How Did You Hear About Us section. It's a win-win. You get something free while supporting the Fairer Sense. Join the 24 million people who've used FreshBooks already. That's freshbooks.com slash TFC. I spoke with Sarah Cooper, who is a comedian and the author of How to Be Successful Without Hurting Men's Feelings. Sarah's super funny, and we had a great conversation. And we talked about everything from how to talk to men without hurting their feelings, to how to get paid, and to being angry as a woman of color. I actually just saw a tweet today by somebody. It was a man, and he said a friend of his, a female friend of his, was let go from her job because she was called uh, difficult. And as his friend was telling him this story, it made him realize that women are called difficult for asking for things that men get automatically. And that was like a kind of a wow moment for me because that was a, a lot of the reason why I was inspired to write the book. I worked in a male dominated world for a long time. I, I kind of went from male dominated world of tech to male dominated world of comedy to very different industries, but both male dominated. And as someone in the minority in those environments, you just, you just have all of these sort of restrictions and rules that you feel like you have to follow um, in order to combat that sexism that you um, experience in small ways and large ways as part of the, as part of just like your everyday working environment. I think a lot of it is just because there, there aren't a lot of women in a lot of these spaces. And so as a woman expressing anger or as a woman expressing any kind of negative emotion, it, it's kind of an anomaly. It's like, whoa, what's, what's wrong with her? And it's, 
but much more accepted for men to express those kinds of feelings. And for women, we're, we're sort of seen as people that shouldn't be competitive and we shouldn't be ambitious and we should really care more about the team than we do about ourselves and our own careers. And so it's, it's really frustrating. Um, and a lot of this is uh, self-imposed because we feel like we need to do these things, but that also comes from just years and years and years of women being in these spaces and not really feeling like we can be as direct as we want to be and getting that feedback that we need to change our tone or be more sensitive. I had another experience recently where um, I was doing a stand-up comedy show and I was getting a bunch of comedians to be on the show and I'd asked like five comedians. They all said yes without asking, ever asking how much I was paying because I had, hadn't actually thought about how much I was paying. Finally, I asked one person who was like the last person and she said, um, what's the pay? And I was like, oh, I, I didn't think about that. Like how much do you usually get paid? And she said, well, you know, I usually make this much per show. And I responded, well, I'll pay you double that because, you know, this is a special show. And then I immediately wrote to everyone else who had already agreed and said, this is how much I'm paying you, even though they hadn't asked. So that one person who stuck her neck out and asked got a raise for every single person on the show. Um, and if she hadn't done that, then, you know, they wouldn't have gotten paid. So I, you know, there's probably lots of stories like that where like just one woman says, you know, I deserve to be paid for this. And because of that, because of not wanting to be exposed to other people, like paying differently to other people who you might be paying differently or not paying at all, you know, everybody sort of gets paid. And so, yeah, I mean, it just kind of inspired me to like, be like, okay, you know what, I'm just gonna say what I want. Or, you know, I've been told that when negotiating, you shouldn't be the first to throw out a number. <laughs> so I've tried that sometimes of just asking like, how much do you usually pay for this or trying to get some information first? And then I had a male speaker tell me like how much he charges. And I think part of being good at negotiating is being able, is knowing that you can walk away. And so definitely try practicing negotiating on things that you are okay if you don't get, because then you have nothing to lose. And so you can start to like push the boundaries and see how much you can actually get paid when the time comes for something that you really want to do. I think negotiating is such a good place to channel our anger. <laughs> I think it's so, it's such a good thing to say, I'm feeling outraged about this. I'm going to put my focus and put that energy into negotiating for more money, for more time off, for better work practices and standards for myself and for others. And I loved your story about one woman pushing brought more money to all the women because yeah, I often like to say to people like, I'm not just interested in getting to the top of the mountain by myself. I want us all up here. So it really is. How can we advocate for all women, not just one woman? I mean, uh, we taught it, we were taught at Google about unconscious bias and like seeing a name that isn't sort of a traditionally American name, whatever that means. And, you know, judging that person because they might be, you know, from a different country or something like that. But ironically, Amazon recently got called out because they were using a resume screening tool that actually was sexist, basically, because if a person's name was a male name, you are more likely to get through the system than if you had a female name or if you had the word like women's, like a women's chess club or something like that. So one of these tools actually prioritized resumes if your name was Jared and you played lacrosse. I thought that was fascinating because it was like, like I have something in my book about gender neutralizing your resume, but you know, this idea of unconscious bias, like it can work the other way too. Like if your name is Jared or John or Jim, like you might immediately get promoted or, or immediately get hired. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I think about that all the time. My last name is Perez. So on a resume, and I've never landed a real job, air quotes. <laughs> I've never worked in an office with a nine to five and had a salary and benefits and all that. And I, I have must have sent out hundreds of applications when I was younger. And I often wondered if I was getting passed over because I was a woman with a Latino surname. I have no proof, but I feel like it may have happened. Which leads very beautifully to my next question, which is, do you feel as a woman of color, like you have to express your anger differently than your white friends, than someone like me who's white passing? I don't have, I don't have like a really good way to express anger other than jokingly, um, sort of making a joke maybe, or, or expressing it to someone who isn't part of the anger that I have. 
because I'm always scared that I'm going to say something in the heat of anger that I'm going to regret. And I, that's like terrifying to me is to say something that I, I'm, I'm going to want to take back later, which a lot of people don't have a problem with that. And I admire that a lot. But I have noticed that, you know, there's, you don't want to be sort of the angry black woman trope. But at the same time, I also think that that's pretty empowering that there is a trope of the angry black woman, because then it's almost like accepted a little bit more than like, white women um, who need to be soft and feminine. I think that they're, they're much more expected to be that. And if they show anything else, it's just an immediately like, whoa, what's wrong? I feel like anger is such a tool. Like what you were saying, some women can just kind of say what they want and not fear the repercussions. I think I'm more in that camp, which I think is a result of many things. I am naturally kind of outgoing. I do have a lot of privilege. I have always had safety nets, but I guess what would you say to all of the women out there who are angry right now about what they can do, about what, how you're doing things? I think women can embrace their anger and not judge themselves for feeling angry. You know, a lot of times we do feel sort of hopeless and sad. And then sometimes when we feel angry, we feel like we shouldn't feel angry or, um, we try to like what I do. I try to repress it and maybe talk my way out of it because, you know, there's bigger problems in the world and the problems that maybe I'm facing or experiencing. But I think embracing it is really important because then you can kind of work through it and move past it. And, use it as fuel for you to ask for the things that you want. Hey, you just asked me to change my tone, but you didn't ask anyone else to change their tone. You know, what's going on with that? Like asking a question and pointing something out, or this is my salary. And I know for a fact that these other people are, are making more than that. And I, I don't think that's fair. All of, all of those things, like it's 100% your right to be upset and angry about it. But when it comes to actually speaking to someone about it, I think you, you need to make sure that you're calm and you are able to have a, a very, very logical uh, discussion about those things. One of the things that Gemma and I talked about off mic was the idea of whether to really call what she's writing about in her book, Emotional Labor. The original definition of it is quite a bit narrower than sort of what she's talking about in the book and what we talked about back in episode four and and today on the podcast. And she really wanted to make the book about invisible labor. But that ship sort of sailed. Her editor at Harper's Bazaar overruled her on that back when the piece was originally written. And then she sort of pot committed on that. You know, she has to go forward with that term. So I think it's it's less important exactly what you call it and more important the concept of women in particular having to do more of this work that others don't notice in an effort to keep people comfortable or to avoid hurting feelings or to avoid being seen as difficult or angry in a professional setting. And all of that is stuff that I think women understand. I mean, we still to this day have our emotional labor up there as one of our very most downloaded episodes. And it's the one that we still get the most mail and tweets about. But it's something that I think takes a lot of guys by surprise because it's not something that they've ever noticed before. And it often can be a really hard conversation to have with a male partner or a male boss or someone of, hey, look, there's this whole world of stuff happening that women are all aware of, but you're clueless about. That's a really hard conversation. The graceful part of me wants to say no man has ever experienced a sexist microaggression, you know, just like no white person has ever experienced a racist microaggression. And then the angry part of me is like, you should believe me when I tell you that this is happening. And so often that belief is not there. And maybe it's partially biological, like, well, I'm not seeing that. I'm not experiencing that. So I'm having a really hard time believing it's actually happening. But when that happens to every woman over and over and over again, or every person of color over and over and over again, it's beyond frustrating. It's beyond enraging. And it becomes oppression. Like that's how we get here. (laughs) And it piles on top of each other where it ties into things where 
men say, oh, well, she's just being hysterical. Like my number one insult is if you call me crazy. I would rather you call me a bitch. I would rather you call me a cunt. If you call me crazy, I get very, very upset. And sometimes T-Bone will do it very off the cuff. He knows it really upsets me. So he tries to avoid doing it. But it, you know, sometimes you just say like, oh my gosh, that's so crazy. Why would you think that? And I'm like, don't. Because <laughs> people have used that word against women. We literally locked women up. So I recently learned about JFK's sister, Rosemary Kennedy, who was lobotomized with her father's permission and sent off to a mental hospital because she was not traditionally feminine. So when you say, oh my gosh, my ex-girlfriend is so crazy. That is steeped in this history of oppression and marginalization and actual abuse. And so that's why it upsets me personally. But that's how we got also to kind of where we are. That's how our society builds. It's I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I don't believe you over and over and over again. It gets woven into the fabric of our society and how we operate. Now, what's uplifting <laughs> is that we have arrived at this point in society where we are having this conversation. And there are a lot of voices in this conversation. And there are a lot of layers to this conversation, which makes it complex, but also means real work is getting done. And that is something I'm super excited to be a part of. Agree with everything you just said. I think that the crazy piece and the not believing piece to me is going back to what we talked about in the opening about where the rage stems from. Is it that we have rage and then we get exhausted, which I do think happens, but I also think really it's it's the rage at not being believed. And the fact that women have been saying for ages, hey, we have all of these economic needs, we have all these social challenges, all of these things holding us back in our careers, and people go kind of like, oh yeah, haha, whatever, they're there, or shut up. And that's why you see so many women now just voicing that anger and running for office and kind of giving no fucks in the workplace and saying like, I'm gonna push for what I deserve or push for other women because obviously, Obviously, being polite and not being believed didn't work. Uh, but one thing I do want to raise, this is something that is, is not an original idea that I get credit for, but I saw today that there's a new book coming out this coming fall called Burn It Down, Women Writing About Anger, edited by Lily Danziger. I'm sure I pronounced your name wrong, Lily, and I'm sorry. Please tell us how to pronounce it correctly if you're listening. But in it, she writes in the intro, which I think was really powerful, who gets to be angry? If there's now space for cis white women's anger, what about black women? What about trans women? And I think that's really important and sort of reflective of where we are right now. Like I think we're at this moment where it's becoming a little bit more acceptable or at least whether it's acceptable or not, at least a bit more normal that white women get to be angry. But what about LGBTQIA women? What about black women or other women of color? You know, it then gets a lot more complicated. And like you said, Kara, I'm glad that we're having this conversation, you know, as much as the Me Too movement sucks that it's necessary, the fact that we're having a debate about what happens to these men who've done shitty things, like should they be canceled forever or do they get a path to redemption? I don't love having that conversation. It's deeply uncomfortable. But the fact that we're having it means that at least on some level, people are listening to at least some of us, at least some of the time. So we still have a long way to go, but it does feel like progress, even if it's messy and even if it's uncomfortable. Yeah. On the one hand, I really don't think we will ever get to the end. You know, I don't ever think we're all going to be sitting around singing Kumbaya. I don't simply, and I don't mean mm -hmm. that in a negative way. I mean that there will always be boundaries to push because our world is ever changing and people are ever changing. You know, 50 years ago, certainly there were trans people, but the idea I think of a trans movement in its current iteration felt probably very far removed. I'm not a trans rights expert. I'd love to get one on the show though. So if you're listening, please send us an email. <laughs> um, but it's happening now in some ways and that's so great. And the next 50 years will hopefully bring more to that community and more to every community. And I also think too, I think about this a lot, how the conversations that happened in the 70s, the conversations that happened in the early 1900s, you know, the push for the sexual liberation and revolution and suffrage and all of these things in the United States, like we stand on the shoulders of those women, flawed and complicated as they were, I get excited thinking about 
the next generation who will stand on my shoulders. The conversations that we are literally having right now on this podcast and in the broader sense in our society, there are 12 year olds who are absorbing this and seeing this and reading and saying, hmm, that's not right. Hmm, this is something I want to get more into. This doesn't feel good to me. What can I change about it? And that is honestly just one of the most exciting things in the world to me. I'm sure this is one of those topics that we could continue to talk a lot about. It's something I know that all women in this society and culture have a lot of thoughts and feelings about because it's something we've all been dealing with for such a long time. We could for sure keep going on, but I think I'd really love to hear from you all listening and hear your thoughts on this. So whether that's email or tweeting at us, we'd love to hear what you think. Yes, you can email us at fairsense at gmail.com. You can follow us on Instagram or send us a DM at fairsense. And we are on Twitter at fairsense as well. All the places. All the places. And of course, we continue to love and cherish everyone who leaves us a review, whether you take the time to write out how the show makes you feel or just tap those stars. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. We hope you'll keep doing it. It is a really great way to support the show and to just bring a little joy into our lives. Oh, I would say big joy, big joy into our lives, not little joy. Yeah, it's true. I mean, like sometimes I read that. <laughs> Obviously we text about it, but also sometimes I'm like, Timo, someone left us a review. And he's like, I'm doing work. I have a life outside your podcast. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> Just know that I'm running around my house reading your reviews to anyone who will listen. <laughs> so if that's not enough incentive to leave a review, I don't know what is. <laughs> oh my goodness. So we have a few episodes left of season three of The Fairer Sense, and we're excited to bring those to you. So until then, stay rad. Stay rad. The Fairer Sense are Kara Perez and me, Tanya Hester. Editing by me. Our theme song is by The Insider. All other music appears courtesy of the generous and mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. If you need music to license for your podcast or other project, check them out at breakmastercylinder.bandcamp.com. You can always find me at ournextlife.com and Kara at bravelygo.co. say stay rad second. It feels weird to say it first, but is it okay if I say it first? Go right ahead.